Before we get into this episode, I have a little BWF PSA. That is a Be Worth Following public service announcement. For those of you that are longtime listeners with the podcast, you may have noticed that this episode came out a month after our previous episode, where previously it would have been every couple of weeks. Why is that? Well, it's because we're making a shift with our podcast. The Be Worth Following podcast moving forward is going to be a once a month endeavor rather than every other week. One of the things that we do here is a little bit different than much of the world of podcasting and certainly different to the world of social media is that we are more long form. Our discussions with folks tend to be between the 30 and 45 minute mark, even a few a little bit longer than that. And as we look at the guests that we have on, just so proud of and excited about presenting them to you, there's always so much depth. We feel like we could do a great job by focusing on one episode per month. So that's what we're going to do moving forward. You're going to hear from us once a month. So each month we'll be featuring a different leader, researcher, or thinker on the topic of leadership. And that's what you can expect from us moving forward. So with that, it's time for us to meet this month's guest on the Be Worth Following podcast. That same nurturing environment that's providing healing from their past traumas is also providing space for risking and failing, for testing out new ideas, for being curious about things that they might have been shamed for in another context. I think those threefold approaches are the strongest way that we lead towards creating innovation in our students. It's pretty amazing what can happen when leaders, even very young ones, are aware of their uniqueness and then leverage it. I'm your host, Tim Spiker, and this is the Be Worth Following podcast. On this show, we talk with exceptional leaders, thinkers, and researchers about what actually drives effective leadership across the globe and over time. You just heard from Christy Gordy, founder of Canopy Life International. In 2003, Christy made her first trip to Kenya and fell in love with its people. As time went by, she developed a passion to unleash the potential within vulnerable Kenyan children from rural communities. In 2014, Christy's passion became her vocation as she founded Canopy Life International, which was followed by the launch of Canopy Life Academy in 2015. Today, Canopy Life is equipping young Kenyans with what they call the heart, home, mindset, and skills to lead their families and communities out of poverty. I'm so excited that you're going to get to hear from Christy today. She comes from a nonprofit background, but she has so many poignant ideas to share that apply to any leader, regardless of scope, position, or industry. As you listen to our discussion, you'll hear the story of how Christy, as an adult, came to accept all aspects of who she is as a visionary, and that includes some that are not traditionally celebrated. You're going to hear the word dance multiple times and in multiple ways related to leadership. And you'll learn about Christy's perspectives on leading remotely. And by remotely, I mean being a leader who is a continent away from most of her team. But first, we learn about a family member who deeply shaped Christie's views on leadership and what it would mean for her to invest her life in a meaningful purpose. My father would be by far the one who shaped my thinking the most. He was a leader himself, but more than anything, he raised me to constantly consider what my purpose was. Why am I here? Um, in my faith tradition, that comes to saying, what is God's will, first of mm. all? And then what is his will for my life, second of all? It, he always emphasized it. And looking back, I think that is the most transformative mindset shift to how I got here. I always had a love for the nations, people of the globe, the beauty and diversity of humanity and creation. And while we didn't have a lot of money or capacity to travel internationally when I was younger, he instilled a love for the world in me. And was constantly asking me to seek out who was this person I was meant to be, what I have, what have I been specially wired to do? And that once you get that mindset in you, it puts you on a trajectory to constantly be considering it. No matter whether you're in high school and I'm starting a group there to do something. I started a drama group in college because I saw a need and felt like I could bring something there. It 
consistently kept me on this path of considering what my purpose is and living a purposeful life, that for sure has impacted me. I think the other person who's greatly impacted me would be Larry Green. He's the founder of Cloudwalk Ministries in the greater Atlanta area. And he's just so great at helping people pursue being like who they were meant to be, like who you are matters more than what you do. And in his context, listening to God teaches you who you are, that you're loved, you're forgiven. And that sounds simple, but many people never get there. It also helped me think along these lines of not just doing for, but doing with my purposeful leader, which is God. I would say experientially, there's a couple of key moments that helped me identify where my passions were. I went to Kenya in 2003, really fresh out of college and lived in the slum of Kibera for six months, which is the biggest slum in Kenya. And I just developed a passion for the potential of the Kenyan people. Felt Mm -hmm. like I might have a place in that story, but if nothing else, just an awe for their potential untapped. And the same thing, uh, I ended up being the tour leader of a children's choir of Kenyan kids that would travel the U.S. for four or five years. And it was the same thing. These children had this incredible potential, but were being held back by incredible odds. They are the leaders that their country needs to move away from poverty, but they need support to achieve their potential. And these experiences were turning points where I had to admit where my heart was drawn to, that kind of purposeful pull. And the one other moment I can think of that's been most transitional, this is going to sound like a great departure from the compassionate moments I've been talking about, (laughs) but I was in Italy uh, in uh, a very cornerstone birthday. I was there with my sister and I had been on a journey leading up to that vacation to consider and explore where this, there was this thing in my root identity that I had been always denying. I had been a part of context in which it had not been really accepted by the leaders around me or the spaces that I had been in. And that was that I was a romantic, which is uh, the more whimsical side of a visionary. And I had been in complete denial that I was wired to be a beauty bringer, a dreamer, a feeler, which are some of the less acceptable parts of a visionary in some leadership context. A lot of contexts like the product that that person is capable of bringing, but don't have a a lot of margin for the person itself. Mm -hmm. But since I had been in denial of that part of me, I wasn't embracing who I truly was in a leadership role. And there was this moment on that trip where I just pulled it up and confessed out loud that I think I might be this (laughs) dreamy romantic. And found immediate affirmation uh, from Mm -hmm. someone that I love the most, that that was who I was, even though we'd never talked about it before. And if who you are matters just as much as what you do, this was a big turning point in accepting myself, being aware and leaning into that strength, delegating the weaknesses that that strength left in its wake. And it helped me overcome some internal shame of being a feeler in a leadership position. And I think from that moment on, it really catapulted forward to being able to be me in the role that I was purposefully created to be. I'm just wondering right now, Christy, if there might be some strong feeler leaders who are listening, who are like now holding their breath to hear (laughs) the rest of your story. You know, there are a lot of things I could comment on as we hear a little bit about your history, but I also have an idea about where we're going in the conversation. And I'm going to let it go there because I think all the things that you just talked about are going to blossom into uh, what we're going to talk about that comes next. So let's get to that part. You have founded and are leading something called Canopy Life, which, by the way, can I just say, what a unique name. That just makes me on the inside want to go, what? What is that? What is Canopy Life? Talk a little bit about what Canopy Life is and how it got started. So Canopy Life is a boarding school in Kenya. It's about an hour outside of the capital of Nairobi. And we're empowering vulnerable children from rural communities to become godly, innovative leaders, the kind of leaders who can create solutions and start businesses that lead others out of poverty. In Kenya, we call this an agent of transformation. Our students come from environments where they face these insurmountable odds. 50% of them won't finish high school. One out of two will experience or witness violence in their childhood home. They face an impossible unemployment rate. And at Canopy Life, in this residential nurturing environment, we tackle these barriers for just a few students, knowing that they will grow into the kind of leaders that will tackle these barriers for many as they grow up in their own context. 
And it's funny, as you question the name, that's actually very much connected to the idea. So Kenya is this semi-arid sub-Saharan harsh savanna with few trees, seasonal streams. Rainy seasons will bring nourishment, vegetation, and it brings life to all the people around it. But during the dry season, all of these disappear along with food provision, right? The The seasonal streams dry up. It will become very dry. But when enough trees can grow together, they create a canopy and those seasonal streams can turn into year round rivers that allow people and the land to flourish. And in 2006, some Kenyan friends and I had an idea. It was a question really, is there a way to create a canopy for Kenyan children living in rural poverty, a safe sheltering place where they could flourish and grow into a canopy for someone else? And out of that came Canopy Life which is our boarding school. So we say we give kids the heart, home mindset and skills they need to become leaders. And what we mean by that is a safe, nurturing home life, critical thinking skills, business acumen and entrepreneurial skills, and a heart that's rooted in a relationship with God and others and bringing healing to those four classically broken relationships, which is the relationship with God, ourselves, others in the world. So they can bring that same kind of health to others in their own ways and purpose. So this is fascinating because here you are based not in Kenya, but in the United States, helping to start a boarding school alongside other Kenyans who it sounds like also have some vision for this. What a bold step. I mean, the I can't even imagine the number of hurdles to getting something like that started and then getting it to continue. So walk us through a little bit about, you know, I'm even thinking about as we were talking about influences for you to be really clear on who you are and what you're about, even going back to what you talked about with your dad, I'm just imagining the energy and wind of that groundedness within yourself that would be absolutely necessary to traverse whatever headwinds would exist in getting something like this started. So share with us a little bit. I I mean, I'm maybe I'm putting words in your mouth and making some assumptions here, but I'm, I'm just guessing there were some challenges along the way. Absolutely. More than I could have ever dreamed when we started it. I think We didn't know how intense the journey would be. We were taking it one step at a time. We were just taking the next right step. And suddenly we found ourselves in this solution that was a residential boarding school. We faced some hostilities early on. Uh, When we first got started, we rented a big house and just started throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what would stick culturally to create a new kind of leader for the country and also help kids reach their potential. And in the area we were, after a year or two, we began to face some hostilities. Turned out later, we found out there was some corruption there. We were Mm -hmm. forced into a season of needing to figure out how to safely continue this vision, which led to raising more money than we had ever raised at that point to buy and build on our own property outside of the city of Nairobi. International construction projects are not for the faint of heart. There's a ton of miscommunication. I've got some Mm. wild stories connected to that (laughs) one, mostly due to my inexperience, but also just the challenge of international communication and Um, We then, of course, settled into the campus in 2019 and a little over a year later hit a pandemic where all of the kids in Kenya were remanded back to their villages away from their boarding schools, trying to figure out how to do virtual learning when even electricity was a question mark. But we really persevered there and saw the benefits. Our kids were engaged at some level virtually while 17 million kids in Kenya were not in school for almost a year. And we saw that affect their Mm -hmm. scores and leadership potential amongst their peers as they continued forward. And, you know, it's really endless. The the Mm -hmm. questions around uh, growing a donor base and casting vision for something that isn't just poverty alleviation, it's imbuing dignity and beauty in the midst of poverty alleviation, how to help a child dream, not just survive, things that just are not always normal in the poverty alleviation conversation have been a challenge. But at every point, I will say there has been provision and a sense of community and wisdom and peace that would guide us through it. And somehow we're here. We just celebrated our ninth birthday. We just had our first high school graduate uh, this past December, and we have 16 coming up on his heels that will graduate at the end of this year. And we're seeing these students have a vision for their future, they are becoming these leaders with entrepreneurial ideas of what can impact their community that we probably didn't even dream was possible early on. I've talked with many people who have started their their own business or their own adventure as, as you're on here. And there's an irony in that 
sometimes ignorance is bliss. And if I knew, like if I got to see all those hurdles before, gosh, it might be hard to start. But the fact that in most cases, I can only maybe see the two or three hurdles ahead of me right now can be a bit of an asset for some of us who are like, wow, I I can only take on a few things at a time. But in the midst of taking on all those challenges, you've alluded to this a little bit already, but I want to unpack it a little bit more. Who do you, as the leader of the enterprise, need to be so that the enterprise can move forward in the midst of challenges that are unique to the context of where it is and then challenges that we all get to see in different ways, like global pandemics and things like that? How do you see yourself needing to show up and be so that you're leading this thing well? Like in my gut, and it's a challenge because I know how hard it is to live up to this gut yeah. response is the visionary. Because in the end, I am thousands of miles away from the application of this vision. I have an incredible Kenyan staff, almost 30 people who are bringing this vision to life, making it culturally true and appropriate, taking constant ownership over the different pieces to grow it into what will take root in that culture. But they haven't seen in their realities where we're going. And Mm -hmm. so I'm having to constantly describe it to them. And then similarly on the U.S. side, my main role is partnership building and finding donors and creating accountability structures. And even in that, we have to constantly be saying, we're not just looking for graduates. That's not our end goal. Our end goal is godly, innovative leaders. It's people who can change and bring transformation to their communities, these rural areas that have no jobs, high levels of home violence and school dropouts. And they can bring that kind of change socially or economically. That's our end goal is to see these students become the leaders they were meant to be. And you have to constantly keep that vision out there while also, I heard this phrase recently from the exceptional leaders, which means I'm sure that you probably had a hand in this definition. But <laughs> I heard the phrase recently, dance with reality. Like a good leader yes. dances with reality. Yeah. Yeah. I could not describe the last nine years more appropriately. And I love the mental imagery because I have a personal love for ballroom. To be clear, I'm not good. I'm not experienced. But it just is one of those places that that romantic that I described really. Christy, I good. think you're the first person ever on the podcast to confess a love for, I'm just going to finish the word. I think you were going to say ballroom dancing. If yes, I, yeah. for ballroom yes. dancing. Well, uh, you're the very first. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not good. I'm not knowledgeable, but I just had a season where it informed so much of my journey. And when you think about a leader dancing with reality, that mm-hmm. is 100% the struggle of a visionary and how a visionary becomes a leader is to constantly wear that tension. In ballroom dancing, the lead can only suggest a step or a movement. The follower has the power to accept or resist that suggestion. And as you can imagine, the more moves that are rejected, the less like a dance it looks like. Yeah. And you can have a lot of reasons for (laughs) rejecting a move that a lead suggests. A follower can be scared of something new or scared of looking foolish. There can be a physical insecurity. They're unsure if they're capable of the move that's being suggested. They may not like it like just preference. They don't want to do that move with that person. Maybe it's too awkward or too intimate. For those listening, I'm six foot tall and short men have always seemed to be very unsure uh, of how to spin me. Like physically we are made proportionate and it works out, but it's always funny for them to boldly (laughs) try it. And I accept the move and then they realize it wasn't hard at all. However, at the same time, I was always uncertain of anything that looked like a dip or a lift because I tended to be proportionately (laughs) larger than the average lead and didn't have confidence in the lead or in my body to accomplish the move. So when I think about this visionary journey, it just matches it. Reality as the lead (laughs) so rarely offers a move that's acceptable to a visionary. It's too restricting. Mm. It's too hard. It's too circuitous. It's ugly to be Mm. like, sometimes it's just really ugly steps that you have to take to get to where you're trying to go. And you're constantly suggesting and renegotiating moves, the visionary and reality. And You don't want to compromise on your vision. Sometimes you're unsure if your resources or skills can accomplish the goal. Sometimes not willing to risk looking foolish. And I will say that has been the tension of growing this organization is 
how do I be me as the visionary constantly describing a place that I know we should get to, but then leading while having that constant dance with reality on how we get there. But when I show up that way, everybody else knows the role that they fall Mm. into. And the more draining times, which is natural for any entrepreneur, is when they're pulled out of that role that they're natural to, to have to do all the other things. I remember early on, another image that came to my mind was as a, an orchestra conductor. I was really intimidated because when we started this journey, I wasn't a parent. I wasn't a teacher and I didn't consider myself an entrepreneur, but I felt purposefully led to start a school that felt like a home that was creating entrepreneurial leaders. And so (laughs) everyone that I would lean on to for advice were experts in their field. And I wasn't an expert in anything. And someone gave me this imagery of an orchestra conductor that the purpose of an orchestra is to make music, but the one person not making a sound is the conductor. Mm -hmm. And often a conductor is leading people who have doctorates in their instrument, telling them what to do. But their goal is to stay true to the composer, to the composition. And I feel like that's very true of a visionary. Like you have this composition of sorts in your vision, in your mind, and you're trying to stay true to that vision while also leading all these people who are much more experienced than you, much more expertise than your own to try to accomplish that vision and making sure everyone's in sync and playing their part and seeking out the sounds that you don't know what instrument makes that sound. I remember having a conversation with someone one time she mentioned design thinking. I knew the sound I needed it to make, but I wasn't sure what tool would make that sound mm-hmm. in the ecosystem of Kenya, what skill sets would give these kids what they need to mm-hmm. become these innovative leaders. And design thinking was the instrument I had been listening for to make that composition make the sound. And so we started implementing design thinking at our school. And these kids are learning that problem-solving skill set that none of their peers are learning. And it was similar with code. That was a little bit more natural. Like we teach our kids to code because the Silicon Savannah is picking up speed as a growing ecosystem in Kenya and digital industry is going to be a great problem solving tool. I I want to come back and talk a little bit about specifically some of the things that you are doing with the students to achieve these ends. But before we get to that, I, I want to come back like you're crushing it in the analogy game today, like between orchestras and ballroom dancing. And those two ideas are really shaping when you sit back and think about them. This idea of dancing with reality and what does that look like and how do you do that and how do you interact with the context and the people that you're leading in such a way that you don't end up a dancer with no partner? How do you make sure that as they're giving feedback, you're receiving it? And yet, I love the word that you used. I think it is so important. That is the word tension. You know, I kind of want to say to those listening and, and frankly to myself as well, if as a leader, my goal, my desire, my end game is to get to the spot where everything's going so well that there's no tension, I think we should all just quit right now because that ain't never going to happen. <laughs> We're going to be in some positives, but where like all tension goes away is mm-hmm. uh, it's just not... It's like almost the the antithesis of leadership, frankly. Right. And so I love that you use that word. I think it's such an important word. And I want to key off of that with the, with the Dance With Reality a little bit, because there is this reality that you're thousands of miles away from the thing that you're leading, or at least the boots on the ground part. Um, you're doing things here as you talk about donor bases and such that you're working with. But you have to have, back to some of that feedback loop you were talking about, You have to have buy-in and commitment to move forward, even as you hold a vision and a picture that maybe others can't quite see. And so talk a little bit about managing that tension, especially in this context of being so far away. And I just want to say, I mean, you guys hear me say this all the time whenever we have somebody who's not particularly from the business space, is that there's chances for us to learn from these other contexts. And here is an amazing one thousands of miles away with a vision that's difficult for others to see. And yet I cannot leave them behind. Otherwise, we won't have the buy-in and commitment that it takes to make it happen. So we can't just pretend like this feedback loop isn't happening. So talk to us about how you manage that tension and making sure that you do have people coming along with you, even as you continue to point to that vision that's maybe not as clear to others. I definitely think trust is key. It's a constant trust building exercise. In my situation, 
it unfolded very naturally. I mentioned earlier, part of my story was touring with this Kenyan children's choir for several years. And that's where some of that compassionate understanding, that purposeful draw to helping them achieve their potential came from. There was a Kenyan couple who traveled with me at that time. And we saw the issue together, that the things we were investing in these kids didn't have time to take root before they were sent back to Mm -hmm. a more aggressive environment. We saw how transformative the choir experience was for them, but also saw how it wasn't preparing them holistically for the future they were going to face with skill sets and innovation that skills that take a long time to develop. So that Kenyan couple, their names are Abu and Grace Odiambo. We really dreamed together and the R and D we did for Canopy Life Academy, we did together. So there were already years of trust, which I honestly think for me, at least my leadership style, we needed that strong foundation of trust. And we had kind of seen a glimpse of what we were trying to do together. We had different perspectives of what that end goal would look like, but I wasn't the only one carrying the vision. So you do have folks that were involved at the genesis of thinking that are closer to the ground in the day-to-day there. Is that is that 100%. accurate to say? Okay. Yes. All right. They are uh, Abu and then also uh, one of our other tour leaders, Lena. They're both still active on staff today. And they had a similar passion. I would even say that their passion for the students' potential informed my own. So it was a very organic growth of this vision. There are parts that I have more of a handle on because I think my vision is the big picture and they each have a different piece that they are very passionate about. And then very early on, we had people enter the story who took other pieces of that big picture vision. I think the other thing that has made it necessary And this is true of any leader, but especially those working cross-culturally, where there is a power dynamic at play that you have to be really cautious of, is a posture of humility. Mm -hmm. This vision will only be successful if it's not mine. For it to be something that lasts, it has to be Kenyan. And Mm -hmm. therefore, I have to let each of the leaders who have joined the story take their piece and make it into something that is theirs. And run with it. That's true of any leader, but it does take a lot of humility. So I think that has been a constant self correction I've had to keep in front of me. I think most driven leaders like myself can lean towards a prideful, well, I know the way. Mm -hmm. But in this case, the literal physical context of what we're doing has continually pushed me back to this place of humility of I cannot bring change to a culture that is not mine. It has to be brought from the inside out and therefore it has to be suitable to that culture. And we're very different culturally, right? They're a shame honor culture. We are a right and wrong culture. So even the way we approach problem solving, there's a Mm -hmm. continual posture of believing the other person is right and better that keeps that trust building and it keeps that collaboration going. And then I'll just say, honestly, technology helps a ton. I'm on Zoom with them all the time. So there's constant conversation happening. So there's constant relational and tactical and data finding exchanges going on that makes it easy. When I started working in Kenya in 2003, I mean, it was dial up paying a dollar a minute for access to the (laughs) internet. So like now we're talking about, I can send photos from yeah. safari or from the bush or and we're not even we're very close to Nairobi so there's a lot of access there to keep those relationships and communication flowing freely. I'm just thinking that when the pandemic hit, can it be life probably wasn't looking at itself saying, "Now what is Zoom? How do we do this?" Like <laughs> I think you guys had a little bit of an advantage there that you'd been operating that way for some time already. We did. We did. And we were just the right size too. The timing came where we would not have been able to as a nonprofit adjust to buying the kind of technology that all of our students would need. But we had a small enough student population as we were growing to be able to take the steps we needed, which was a real blessing in the midst of a hard season. Well, let's turn our focus to the students. Some of the words that you've used as we've been talking about these students consistently here are leadership and innovative. And I know that leaders are constantly saying, how do I help the folks I'm leading be innovative? How do I help them think outside of the norm. We don't want to just pave the cow path here. How do we actually make a super highway? How do you approach education in a way that fosters innovation in the students? That's a great question. And I will say that we are still learning 
even nine years in, it feels sometimes like we're a triple startup. <laughs> we just restarted <laughs> a couple of times. But the first step for us within the Kenyan context is to add critical thinking to the classroom. It's a global challenge, but it's especially true in countries where rote memorization is the key way that they advance from class mm. to class. Kenya itself is undergoing curriculum reform, and they're unfolding a much more critical thinking, student-focused type curriculum, but we were already doing it a few years ahead of them. And that is to teach kids to think, ask open-ended questions, to know what the right question is, not just how to give the right answer. So that was our first step. And then we are developing our own innovation program that really focuses on both character qualities and measurable skills. Character qualities being things like curiosity and grit and resilience. And then skill sets such as design thinking, which is a great problem-solving approach out of Stanford University that teaches you how to both develop products or solutions that are user-friendly. We would call it others-focused, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and it helps you solve problems for others, not just for yourself when you're developing products or starting a business. I think there's definitely also a piece of emotional safety. So you can say that the emotional health piece is part of the inwardly sound part of what mm -hmm. we do. We have a counseling program that helps these students to heal from their rural trauma. But there's also this part of um, creativity does not flourish. Innovation cannot flourish in a place where there's not safety. So that same nurturing environment that's providing healing from their past traumas is also providing space for risking and failing, for testing out new ideas, for being curious about things that they might have been shamed for in another context. I think those threefold approaches are the strongest way that we lead towards creating innovation in our students. You know, there's certainly something for all of us to think about, because as I hear that, I understand that there's a context to younger folks with those things. But I'm not sure there's anything that you said that doesn't also apply to us as adults. Where does our emotional health come into play as we're seeking to go take risks and try new things? And did we branch out, you know, one of our early, maybe as a child or early uh, employment opportunities and somebody smacked us on the hand. And so now we've come back and we're holding back that piece of ourselves because of something that happened 15 years ago at the hands of maybe a really underdeveloped leader. And now the people around us aren't getting the best of us. And as leaders, for us to ask ourselves, if you see something that you feel like, gosh, wouldn't it be better to be really curious and think about wh what are the supporting mechanisms that might unleash that innovation, that might unleash that risk-taking, that might unleash that creativity. And so in the midst of you applying it in an educational environment, I feel like I'm also hearing the story of humanity, not just the story of children, but the story of adults as well. And how do we get into space where we can be innovators as well? 100%. I mean, I would say that's part of my story. Even though I'm entrepreneurial, would say that I have struggled with a very fixed mindset, not a mm -hmm. growth mindset, with having my hand slapped one too many times to where I would pull back who I was and what I could bring to the world and have to constantly challenge myself to lean in. Our Kenyan leaders, these amazing administrators, teachers, house parents that work at our school, they were raised by the same harsh environment that we're asking them to bring kids out of. So our staff is constantly having to ask the same questions of ourselves and to learn the same lessons ourselves that we're hoping our students will learn and hoping that since they're learning it much younger than we did, that they will have even greater potential to bring change to the people they love. Well, as we, as we begin to turn towards home here, I, I do want to talk about the word leadership, not as if we aren't talking about that all the time, but specifically you're developing leadership within these young people. And I'm curious, what is the approach on that? So essentially, same question as I ask around innovation, what is the approach to create the possibility for leaders to grow and develop through Canopy Life? I'll have to steal some language from what I've heard you guys say, because you say it so much better than what we've said, but it truly is learning to be inwardly sound and others focused. Mm -hmm. And it's learning to become who you were made to be and let your leadership flow out of that. So we spend a lot of energy teaching them how to know who they were created to be. That comes out of a personal practical faith and a strong character. We encourage them to be relationally rooted. I think this is a little bit easier outside of the individualistic 
Western culture, but they know the part that they have to play in their family and community. There's people who need them and their identity is connected to that community. And so they know that they were put in this place for such a time as this and have special skills that they were given to bring to play in order to bring change. Knowing who you are and owning the community you're placed in, there's a belonging there that empowers you to lead when you know who you belong to. And so our values at Canopy Life are beauty, belonging, and innovation. Beauty representing what happens when you have this holistic healing to some of these four relationships, but belonging is knowing the place you have in your community and the role you have in it and innovation being the solutions you bring to that community. What I hear from that is we're going to develop who the student is as a human being, not just their knowledge base. And we're going to create space that while there are some core things we want to be true amongst all students, we also recognize that they're all individuals created a little bit differently and will have different specialties in terms of interests and capabilities. And so while we have a foundation that we want to be consistent, we want them to grow out of that in all the different directions that they might have been created to grow. And so what I hear in that is a grounding with space. It almost reminds me of the secure attachment concept with parenting in that I'm attached, but because I'm attached in a healthy way, I have the security to go explore. And I remember seeing this early on with my own kids as they would kind of, we'd go to the water park and they were younger and they'd take a few steps and they'd look back to make sure we were still around and like, yep, we're still here, which means you can go. We're still here, so you can take a few more steps. You can go over there and check out that water feature that you've been scared of before or whatever. But that that attachment to something healthy and good and solid is what enables that exploration to happen. Otherwise, I feel like I'm twisting in the wind and and maybe I'm all by myself in in a way that's not safe, in in a way that maybe is dangerous. And so what I hear you is building that secure attachment to be able to go out and explore who you are even as we we hold you in a grounded way here. Does that does that sound fair? That, that's very well said. <laughs> I think the probably the one thing I would say, and this is just the nonprofit leader in me, is for the business leaders out there, I know that they are working hard facing these same challenges in a very different way and constantly trying to develop leaders in their own communities, in their own organizations. It is such a blessing when that type of leader can lift their eyes to leaders that are next generation leaders from other countries where other solutions may be coming from in the future. And I want to thank those who are doing it already and encourage you, if you're not doing it, that if you can find an outlet like an organization like ours, where you can pour into next generation leaders that may or may not be, they might be American, they may not be American, but there's a generation rising up who will be, who need a skill set, need to learn from us and don't always have access. And so I would love to just continue to encourage business leaders to be looking to the next generation for who they can pour into, whether it seems like a long-term relationship or not. We have people who come and they'll come on a 10-day trip to Canopy Life. You know, they get five or six days pouring into our students and staff on campus and then go on a safari for a couple of days. And it's a very purposeful vacation, very purposeful getaway. (laughs) But the impact that they leave behind when they bring all of that expertise, when they bring that insight and can humbly offer it to students and even offer to learn from them, you can't imagine the life change that happens in just that short exchange or when you engage your organization in service, right? You have this big corporation with employees or maybe a small mom and pop shop with employees and giving some purpose to the work that you're doing by making it serve others, not always the clients, but impacting other needs can make a big difference to building the community in your own business. There's been business leaders who've really impacted our work. And I was so grateful they stepped outside of their context to pour into us. And especially those who came in wanting to learn. A lot of people will look down on a developing country as if there's nothing to offer. They're coming in to teach. But man, the ones who come in and say, we're all leaders in very different contexts. The power of that humility and that presence can literally change lives. I'm just very grateful for leaders who have that posture and encourage leaders who haven't tried it yet to give it a try because it can really transform you as a leader and the way that you lead your community, your organization. I know I'm a broken record, but I'm going to say it again. I love having non-business leaders on the podcast. 
I think there's just so much to learn from other sources of leadership than just in business. And this discussion with Christy was no exception to that. And before I dig into some content, let me say, you heard Christy talk about people coming to visit Canopy Life, these 10-day trips. And maybe you or you and your team need to do that, need to get out there and be a part of what Christy's doing. Having said that, let me get to a couple of quick items to touch on as we wrap up. First of all, the issue and topic of self-awareness. You heard it in Christy's story, in her own growth as a leader, coming to accept the idea of being a feeler and a romantic. These are not words that are normally attached to leadership. And yet, as a visionary, they can show up in really valuable ways. And so you heard what happens. For Christy to be able to lead what she's doing, this step of acceptance and understanding, this self-awareness, even around things that might not be traditional to talk about in the leadership space, and then she's able to leverage that and also delegate to others the things that she's not as talented in. Then we got a chance to hear basically that same idea starting to come to life for the students. Canopy Life, providing that space for students at much earlier ages than adulthood, coming to a clearer and clearer understanding of who they are so that they can then take that into the world and lead out of that self-awareness. You know, there's something about self-awareness that we really need to hold on to as leaders, and that is it does not happen by accident. Dr. Tasha Yurick, a researcher around the issue of self-awareness, says that 10 to 15% of leaders are actually self-aware. We will not accidentally end up in a space of self-awareness as leaders. So if we're going to be self-aware, it is going to have to be an intentional effort on our part. Another critically important concept in leadership that you heard from the very beginning of this discussion is the topic of purpose. What does it mean to be a purposeful leader? When we talk about being purposeful as a leader with our clients, we talk about being intentional about how you are investing your life and living in alignment with what is most important to you. As I share that definition of being purposeful, can you imagine any greater example of that than what we just heard from Christy Gordy and how she is leveraging her gifts and skills in life. She is the epitome of a purposeful leader. But it makes me think about so many of us in the business community who might say, well, you know, how purposeful can I be? I'm a middle manager in accounting or even as a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, my eye is on our capital expenditures and our stock price. That's, you know, perhaps purposeful for our shareholders, but I'm not sure that it rises to the level of the purpose that Christy has with regard to these Kenyan children. And I just want to caution you from dismissing that too quickly. And here's what I mean by that. If you're a regular listener, you've heard me many times quote John Ott because he's just so darn quotable. He is a good friend and colleague. Here's the way that John defines personal values. He says this, it's what I'm doing while I'm doing what I'm doing. I love that definition. See, no matter what role you are as a leader in any organization, business or otherwise, there is a way that you are showing up. And so the end goal of the activity, the end goal of your role may not be to send young Kenyans out into the world to lead their families and communities out of poverty as Christie is doing. But you are having a profound impact on the people that you are leading every single day, no matter what your role in business is. You have an outsized impact as the leader into the quality and fulfillment of the people that you are leading. So whether you see your role as particularly unique or not, oh, I just work in as a sales leader, or I am just the head of finance, or whatever your leadership role might be, you might look at that and not think that it is a profound role. But the role of leader is profound. And so it behooves all of us to think about, how am I showing up? This is my role, but back to John's quote, What am I doing while I'm doing what I'm doing? How am I showing up? How am I performing the leadership role that I have in this organization? 
there can be amazing, important, and profound purpose in getting really clear about that as a leader. So that leads me to the question I want to leave you with today, and that is this. What are you currently doing to better understand who you are and how to leverage your uniqueness? This is Tim Spiker reminding you to be worth following and to follow us wherever you receive your podcasts. If you've heard something valuable today, please share our podcast with your friends, family, and colleagues. And if you're up for it, leave us a five-star review. Thanks for listening.